We were, we're in Genesis chapter 4 still, if you find your place there, and I'll get right into our thoughts tonight. We talked about already the first of seven destructive thought patterns, and we talked about expectations and, and tried to deal with all that uh, last night, and that's, that's an extensive one. Of course, there's so much more that can be said on all of these different things. So I put up here um, on the board, though... Does anyone know what this is? Huh? A quark. Quark? No. Quarks are much smaller. All right. That's our first point of the night. All right. Our first point tonight is there in verse number eight. Of our text. Now we're going to read starting in verse number three, and we're going to read all the way up to verse number eight, and then we're going to get to what's on the board. It says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thy wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. When we think about this passage, we obviously see the the process here that, that comes from the expectation, it leads into anger, and it goes on here as Cain is now in the field with Abel, and it's fairly obvious to me that the context of this conversation has to do with the rejection of the offering previously as God lays these two things side by side, right? There's a, there's a fluid... Uh, through this text and so the context of their conversation as they're in the field they are talking and we don't know what they're speaking of and we don't even need to speculate but it's it's evident in this passage that these two things Cain killing his brother and God receiving Abel's sacrifice and rejecting Cain's sacrifice that these two things go together and it's reasonable then to assume and to understand this that Cain was fixated on the problem of the rejected sacrifice and he would not let it go. He was fixated on this and I put this point up here as a as a little thing, I do this in counseling. I'll just draw on a white sheet of paper one little dot, and I'll say, what is this? And everyone says, it's a dot, it's a spot, it's a circle, it's a whatever. And everyone ignores the fact that there's a whole lot here other than that spot. And this is what we do with our problems. We fixate on them. And this is what Cain did. He fixated on one thing, and he would not move forward. And God warned him about this. He warned him that if he did not give, it, give this sin over to God, if he didn't, didn't turn away from this expectation problem and put the sin of anger away from him, notice what he says in verse number 7, uh, Unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He said it'll, it'll dominate you. The desire for the fulfillment of your expectations and the lust of your flesh will, he says, and thou shalt rule over him. This is an interesting statement because um, what happens is, is we think we are in control of our expectations and our lusts until they are in control of us. You think that you are ruling over your lusts, but you're not. How many times have you heard someone say, I can quit that anytime? time, Right? Well, I don't, I don't have to drink, I don't have to smoke, I don't have to do, I don't have to do that. I can quit any time I want. And that's always the feeling people have about their lusts. But it's not the reality of lust, is it? It dominates us. 
and he had a fixation on this. Let's think about this problem fixation for just a moment because we have a tendency to do this where we fixate on broken expectations as Cain did. And I, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've gotten up in the morning in a really good attitude and everything was going well and it wasn't long into the day, but someone broke one of my expectations and it seemed like the rest of the day it was clouded by that one thing that happened back there. It carried it with me and it was a problem the rest of the day it made everything worse all day long and I got home and it was like that one thing but why was it still a problem because I was still focused on it I wasn't letting go of it I was carrying it with me I put it on my back and I said I'll I'll tote this along and I'll make sure that it doesn't go away I'll keep this as a an object of attention if you will throughout my day and this is exactly what we see Cain doing why would he do this well first of all there's a significant amount of self-justification in this, in this passage. And we would say self-justification based upon his intentions. His intentions were good. His intention was to bring an offering to God. Why would God reject my offering? I had the right heart in bringing it. I wanted to honor him. I wanted to bring this offering and do something for God. And, and I should have been accepted. And why would he accept your offering and not my offering? And all of this justification and self-justification has, really has no end point, does it? Because we can always compare our intentions with the outcome. That's not what I meant. You ever have this at home with your children as they're playing and maybe as they're playing, one inadvertently hits the other one, or so they say. Um, and they hit the other child and the second child, the one that gets hit, is crying and you say to the first child, hey, you need to apologize. And the, and the response goes something like this. Well, I didn't mean to hit them. Okay, but you did hit them and you need to apologize. But I didn't mean to. Does that matter? Concerning whether they should apologize, it doesn't matter, does it? But we have a tendency to do that as adults too, by the way. Where we fixate on a problem and our intention was right. Our intention was good. Therefore, we should not be judged. We have a tendency to judge others by their actions, but want them to judge us by our intentions. That's a problem. We have that judgmental spirit. Now, I can, I can tell someone's judgmental just by looking at them. But we always justify ourselves, don't we? Well, but I, I, know, I know this, and I, well, I've done this, and I meant this, and this justification process, it creates a problem. And what it creates is this. It creates perceived injustices and perceived rejections. And I, I use the word perceived here because in, in reality, was there an injustice in this text? On God's part, no. But on Cain's part, yes. And yet Cain is the one that thought injustice had been done to him. And so there was a perceived injustice. How dare God not receive my offering? And we live in a culture where perceived injustice is a huge issue. All this, this cultural uh, non nonsense about, you know, uh, the, the equity and, and all the social justice and all these type of things. And we use this word nowadays. It's a very, very common word, the word fair. It's not fair. This isn't fair. That's not fair. The preacher didn't treat me fair. Uh, the, the police didn't treat me fair. The taxes aren't fair. The job isn't fair. Everything's unfair. And fair, 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 fair. Now, fair is a primary word that's used by people that deal with resentment. But the problem with fair is it's always subjective. Fair is based on what you think. It's not just, it's not justice. Justice is based on fact. Fair is based on feeling. And the problem is, is that we as Christians can sometimes get wrapped up in living a life based on our perceptions and our feelings and our sense of fairness. And these injustices can overwhelm us and we fixate on them. And it can be a minor thing and yet dominate our thinking and dominate our life. 
I remember years ago, Brother Castillo had um, had uh, Don Green in to preach, and he was a character. Don Green was a, quite a character, but <clears throat> he shared this story about going into a church, and he said he preached, and he said it was very evident this side of the auditorium did not like that side of the auditorium, and vice versa. And he said they would people would come in, and they would divide at the back door and go around and sit, but they wouldn't walk down the middle aisle, and there was this conflict. And so he was preaching a revival that week, and uh, in toward the end of the week, a lady came forward from one side and she said, uh, Preacher, I know why that God's not moving. She said, myself and the lady at the piano had a, an argument 20 years ago at a church dinner and I, I brought something and she dropped it and broke it and I accused her of doing it on purpose and the whole church took sides and no one's been saved in this church since. Can you imagine fixating on a jar of something? And yet we do that, don't we? We fixate on many times insignificant things, but perceived injustices. They probably meant to hurt me. They, they, I purpose, I was going to say hi to them, and I saw they walked the other way, you know. I went to shake their hand, and they didn't even hold out their hand. They just walked by. And we perceive injustice as if we have never been distracted or had something else on our mind and potentially missed doing something or saying something that we otherwise should have. But we read injustice into all kinds of situations. And so Cain has a perceived injustice. Not only a perceived injustice, but a perceived rejection. And not only does Cain deal with this issue of of perceived rejection, but Saul deals with this issue of perceived rejection uh, on a personal level. And I want to say it like this because... Paul was rejected from being king, but the reason for Paul's reje- Saul's, re- I said Paul, Saul's rejection wasn't because God hated Saul. It was because Saul disobeyed God. And the problem we have there is this same problem we see with Cain. God gave Cain an opportunity to repent, but Cain refused to repent. Do you not think God, the merciful, loving God who forgave and turned his will concerning Hezekiah's death, might not have turned his will had Saul been repentive? Well, God is merciful and kind. You say, well, I don't know if he would have. I don't know either, but we'll never know, will we? But we do know God's merciful. He's good. And we also know Saul never repented. He never turned. He never changed. He lived the rest of his life with this rejection complex and fixated on this idea that this kingdom was his. It was his, and he couldn't lose it. And if he lost it, this would be the worst possible thing. And and he had had to keep it. He had to save it. He had to make sure that no one took it. And David was the enemy because David was going to take his kingdom, and he was fixated on it. And fixation leads to lots of other problems. Obsession. Compulsive behavior, which is exactly what we see with Saul. And he tried to kill David, and David fled, and he chased David. And remember, David cut the hem of his garment off and and called to him. And Saul said, I'm wrong, I repent. And he went back, and he said, I won't chase you anymore. And then what do we, like a chapter later, he's out there chasing him again, isn't he? Because of this perceived injustice and this perceived rejection on the part of God that Cain fixated on this problem of protecting his kingdom. He was absolutely certain that it was necessary for him to pass it on to Jonathan. And Jonathan didn't even want it. But Saul was fixated on giving it to him. How dare you, Jonathan, not want what I know is best for this and for And really, here is the problem. He didn't want it for Jonathan's sake. He wanted it for his. It was his legacy. It was his lust and his legacy, you see. But this perceived injustice, perceived rejection can be problem fixations. How about this? The what ifs. We fixate on what ifs. Years ago, when we were first married... We went to, uh, I lived in, we lived in Goodland, or, yeah, Goodland, Kansas, which is right on the border of Colby, uh, Colby uh, C- Colorado. And um, so I w- was working this job that took me over into Colorado. It's an hour time difference. And I 
was working one day and it started snowing. Now, some of you young people might not even believe this, but this was before cell phones. That's how old I am, all right? And so here I am over in this, uh, in Colorado, it starts snowing and I finished my little route and I, I thought, eh, it's not that bad. I get in the car and by the time I get to the highway, it's a blizzard. I mean, you can't see very far at all. And I, and I thought, well, I'll just drive slowly and patiently and I'll, I'll get home. It's 30 miles. So I drove home and I get to our little apartment. Mind you, we've been married all of maybe three months at this point. And so I go to open the door. It's locked and I am knocking on the door and finally the door swings open and Angela's standing there and just tears streaked in her face, and she just goes, wham, right into my chest, and then slams the door. And I thought, what did I do? Men know what I'm talking about right there. What did I do? So finally, I, talking through the door, get her to unlock it and let me in. And she said, "Uh, it started snowing, and you didn't call? And I was just imagining you dead in a ditch and I've been married three months and I'm a widow already and and she's got all this built up in her head. I know none of you ladies have ever, you know, done anything like that. Built up this entire narrative in which I am dead. I don't know how many times I have died in this lifetime, but I'm certain. (laughs) Now it's not like the fearful thing. She's like... You know you've got good insurance. If this happened, that would have... So now her what-ifs are like, well, what if that happened? I could definitely buy that beach house. I could do that, you know. And um, so it's, it's less fearful now. But and you think I'm joking, but I don't think I am. So, but we get the what-ifs, don't we? And we, we what-if a scenario to death. And, and we have all of these, uh, these things that... And, and we're stressed and we're consumed with... Well, what if this, 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 what if this? And, you know, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. It's, it's a cycle of fear. It's very exemplified with Saul. And all the what if this, and what if, what if David doesn't, if, what if he escapes, what if he's over there, what if this, what if that? And he's consumed with this, fixated on this, and there's actually... Nothing happening. It was all in his head. David wasn't trying to take the kingdom from him. David wasn't trying to turn people against him. David would have stayed by his side all the way to the end and died for Saul. But in Saul's mind, all of the what ifs consumed him. And he fixated on them. It was a lack of faith. It was a lack of faith. You know, you can't solve problems that don't even exist. You say, well, what if they do? Well, God will be there. Do you think he knows what's coming? Well, certainly he does. He knows everything, and he knows all the way to the end. He can see it already. He's already there. He already knows the solution. I don't have to figure out the problem. I just have to trust that God's in control. But those what ifs, problem fixation. Here's a, a final what if, all right? Of, uh, not what if, but a final problem fixation. That is unresolved conflicts from our past. That is the things we talked about the other day, the, the abuses, betrayals, conflicts, and deaths, and disease, and those type of things. Unresolved conflicts, things that hang over our head that we have not yet given to the Lord. We haven't yet turned them over. We haven't brought them to the cross and exchanged the offense for his forgiveness and receive that. Some people asked me this the other day, and maybe I didn't explain it uh, well or or didn't get into it extensively, but, you know, when we come to the cross, the question is, well, what if this person, back to the oneness, what if they they do this again? And understand this, restoration of relationship, restoring a relationship requires repentance on on the part of the other person, just like it does with us and God. You understand? God has chosen forgiveness so we can choose forgiveness. But that forgiveness, choosing forgiveness, doesn't mean we automatically restore a relationship. It simply means we're willing to restore. Does that make sense? We're willing to restore. We've come to the place where we say the offense is under the blood. And if they 
are repentive and they're willing to come and acknowledge that Christ is sufficient to cover their offense, then we can meet here and we can restore this relationship. Forgiveness does not mean I, they slapped me in the face and I go, okay, I forgive them and I go back and they, now they slap me again. And I know the Bible says that we're to turn the other cheek and I certainly believe there's a, the, the context. There's no question about that. But we're talking about when, there's, when there are things that have created separation. I'm, I'm, for instance, a, a woman who has maybe been in an abusive relationship and, and the pastor says you need to forgive that doesn't mean she needs to move back home if he's still standing there with a baseball bat. Until there's repentance, until he comes to acknowledging of his sin and deals with that, she can choose forgiveness and wait for repentance. All right? But we are often still carrying those burdens, those unresolved conflicts, and, and when we are, we're fixated on them. Some years ago, I... Um, Angela and I had a, in our first church, we purchased a very small house and we sold it to the next pastor and we sold it, essentially we had a loan on it and we sold it to him with the idea he was going to pay it off in a, in a short period of time and he never did and so we were still paying the loan and we were paying interest but in his mind there was no interest so he paid a certain amount and we still had money owed but he paid it over time, and it's a long story, right? But anyway, we ended up, we still owed money on the house, and he's like, well, it's paid off. No, it's not paid off. The bank still, you know, says there's money owed. And anyway, there was this conflict, and, and I, got, I got so upset. I got angry at this guy, and I was so fixated. And I did do this, and I hate that I have to admit this, okay? But I, I prayed imprecatory prayers about him. I prayed about God bringing judgment on him and, and all those type of things. And you say, I just, that's just horrible. You're right, it's horrible, but I did it. I did, just like David did. And there I am praying these things, and I did that for weeks, and I was miserable because I was fixated on him. And God's got to bring judgment on him. And God's got to deal with this, and I've been wronged. And, oh, oh, oh. and I was so fixated on him that it stole my peace, my joy, and hearing from God. And I'm doing my devotions one morning after several weeks, and I'm reading, and I'm like, God, why, did, why aren't you speaking to me? And all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit said, because you're not listening to me. <laughs> you know what I had to do? I had to get down on my knees and ask God to forgive me for my wrong spirit, my fixation on that problem. And I had to turn it over to him. And you know what happened? That other guy didn't change. But God took care of the debt. Praise God. I didn't have to carry it anymore. I gave it to the Lord. Now, let me tell you the other side, the saddest part of that side. Five years later, that guy committed suicide. And the reason he committed suicide, he said he just could not stand having having all the people who, have, who had wronged him in his life, and he just could not stand seeing all these offenses against him any longer. Can I tell you something? You may look at everyone else that's wronged you and fixate on those problems, but it'll never draw you closer to God, and it'll never solve any of those problems. But if you take them to the Lord, he can give you peace. And I'm telling you this, if you fixate on those problems, you'll destroy your life. It will destroy you. Don't do it. So we see problem fixation. Here's a, the next thought process. Notice in verse number 9, the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Blame shifting. It's not my fault. Now, Cain knew very well where Abel was. He'd left him there in a bloody pool. But he had shifted blame for his wrongdoing in the offering onto Abel. Therefore, he was able to justify himself in vengeance against Abel. And then he was able to shift blame away from himself saying, well, I don't know, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything. You know, you ever, had, you ever had that moment? We had four kids, okay? There were times we would walk into a room. And as soon as we walked into the room, they would all go like this. And one of them would say, I didn't do it. 
That's the one we started with, you know. I didn't do it. I, am I my brother's keeper? He was a blame shifter. We know that Adam began that process of blame shifting, right? Uh, back uh, earlier, he said, the woman, but here's the key, thou gave us me. He wasn't blaming her, he was blaming God. But here, Cain blames Abel, and then Cain excuses himself, what, you know, it's got to be someone else, I, I'm, not his, I'm not his keeper. But notice the extent of his, uh, of his blame shifting, look in verse number 14, he says, Behold, thou, speaking to God, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. So, God, ultimately, it's God's fault too. It's Abel's fault, someone's fault, who knows who, and it's God's fault. It's always someone else's fault and never my fault. A lack of taking responsibility. Remember last night when we were in chapter number three there, and we talked about the responsibility that God speaks of. I'm sorry, in chapter number two, um, that, that first area of responsibility in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, the, the physical responsibility and the moral responsibility. And what we have in this passage is someone who refuses to take moral responsibility for his actions. And a refusal to take this moral responsibility is a destructive thinking pattern that is leading to his destruction. And he, and he processes it three different times in three different ways. And blame shifting becomes a pattern of life that we just slip into. It's never our fault. It's always someone else's. It's my wife's fault. Um, you know, I would be a better husband if my wife, it's my kid's fault, it's my boss's fault, it's my pastor's fault, it's probably his wife's fault for sure too, and it's someone else's fault, it's my Sunday school teacher's fault, it's the government's fault, certainly. Can we all just vote on that? It's the government's fault, right? All right. So... It's always someone's fault, but it's never my fault. Why? Well, because I've been justifying myself this whole time. I've been excusing my own sin and overlooking it because my intentions were good no matter how bad the results were. And so this blame shifting becomes a life pattern and a, a thought process and a refusal to take responsibility. When we talk about counseling, and we, uh, we'll harken back here to the other day, I mentioned the process of counseling, of, of uh, questioning to understand and questioning to reveal, judging from the word until there is repentance. And can I tell you, friend, Repentance requires taking responsibility. You have to acknowledge you were wrong. And you are responsible for the decision you made. You must take responsibility. I think about this issue of, of repentance. In a, it's an interesting thing in the book of Job. Now, in Job, you know that that Job comes along and, and he has all the afflictions because uh, God allows Satan to bring these afflictions into his life. And Job's friends uh, say, you know, Job's having a bad time. Let's go comfort him. That's the word, comfort. They, they came to comfort him. And, and they sat for several days quietly. And that was probably comforting until they opened their mouths. And then they brought judgment now, listen to what I'm going to say. They brought judgment they thought would help. They honestly believed they were there to help. They really did. But their judgment did not help. And the reason it didn't help is not because it wasn't true things. It's because they weren't true about him. There are many of the things. Read the things that his friends say. Many of them are good and right things. Not all, but many of them are. But they weren't true about Job. And so Job has this conflict with him, and he's like, no, that's not true, and that's not true, and that's not true. And he makes that statement that the reason he had not received comfort, he said, you're miserable comforters. Because the stuff you're saying doesn't apply to me, even though you're trying to convince me that it does, it doesn't apply to me. And so the next thing that happens in Job is that God begins to bring judgment, and God's judgment is very specific and deals with Job exactly where he is until he comes to this place where the Bible, Job said, I repent myself in sackcloth and ash, in dust and ashes, right? He says, I repent myself. Now, catch, this is an awesome thing, okay? The word repent... There where he says, I repent myself, 
is the same word as comfort every other place in the book of Job. That's interesting. As a matter of fact, look through the scriptures at the word repent, and what you'll find is the context almost always includes comfort. Now that makes a strange sense, doesn't it? How can repentance, brokenness, falling before God, acknowledging my wrongdoing, acknowledging that I have, that I have sinned and, and I am turning to him, how can that and comfort be synonymous in the book of Job? And here's the reason. Because repentance is the removal of the weight that you are carrying because of your burden of sin. As long as you refuse to repent of it, you must carry it. But as soon as you come to a point of repentance, guess who carries the weight? Christ. And he reaches down and he takes that weight and he says, that's paid for. And you are now comforted. Has there ever been that time in your life? I know in my life when I came to that place of repentance and, and I could explain it like this. It's like, it's like a weight was just lifted off of me. I was comforted because of repentance. But, but we sure struggle against it, don't we? We sure fight against that point of repentance. We want someone else to take the blame. We don't want to be blamed. It's got to be someone else's fault. But yet we must come to a place of repentance if there is going to be any salvaging of our life. Well, Cain refused repentance. So Cain refused to change his expectation. Cain refused to stop fixating on the problem. Cain refused to accept responsibility. Here's number four. Look at verse number 13. <clears throat> He says, and Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Here's the, the fourth destructive thought pattern, victimhood. Cain committed murder and his punishment was greater than he could bear. Right? Wait a minute. You're the one that did wrong to begin with. And then you did more wrong. And now you're the victim? Isn't that amazing how that works? It's not changed much in all of these years from the time of Cain to, Cain to today, has it? It's, it's amazing how quickly people who do wrong also claim victimhood status. And this victimhood, I, I've, been, I've been done so wrong. Can I tell you that the issue here, and this is an important marker, and I think it's a transitional marker in this thought because he refused to take responsibility and come to a place of repentance, taking that responsibility. And so when we, when we come to a place of repentance, one of the evidences of repentance in the Scriptures is that we accept the consequences of our sin. Okay, so a guy goes out and commits adultery and he comes and he confesses it because he was going to get caught probably anyway. And he confesses it or he gets caught and confesses, which is often the case. And he confesses and he says, I repent, I was wrong, forgive me. He cries and then his wife says, you know, I feel like it's going to take me time to trust you again. And he says, how dare you not forgive me? How dare you treat me that way? Why, God doesn't treat me like that, and she's treating me wrong, Pastor. Look what she's doing. Here I have come and repented, and look how she's behaving. Has he repented? No. You know why? How we know? Because he's saying... My punishment's greater than I can bear. Come on. It doesn't have to be that extreme, by the way, for this to be the case. When we are looking at ourselves as a victim, it is an evident token that there has not been repentance in our life. Because we're still justifying 
We're still explaining away. We're still looking at this injustice and fixated on that injustice. It's just shifted now a little bit. And we're now becoming more and more of a victim. And this victimhood mentality is so destructive to our world. I'm just telling you, uh, there's, there's never been a time in the world, in the history of the world, where more people had more opportunity than right here. And yet our nation is fixated on the idea that everyone's a victim. Well, except me. And that's just true. Everyone's a victim. Let me tell you something. Injustices are horrible. They're bad. I'm not for them. There's no justification for them, for legitimate injustices. But everyone has to take responsibility for themselves and where they're at or they're never going to have victory in their life. And so the longer that we allow ourselves to live in victim mentality, the more destructive it is to our life because we never take responsibility for ourselves and move forward. And this victimhood mentality that Cain brings upon uh, uh, along here, it's, it's that, you know, any punishment is too much because I didn't mean to do wrong and I shouldn't be judged because my intentions were right and, and I've, been reje- I've been rejected and, and I've been mistreated and all of these type of things. Now, let's a- an- analyze just for a moment this thought. This, was his punishment inju- unjust? Well, of course it wasn't. It wasn't even to the extent that we know God claims justice under the law. In reality, Cain received mercy in this judgment. He should have died himself. But God didn't kill him. So he received mercy, and it was still too much. Victimhood. Terrible, destructive thought pattern. Let's move on to the next one. Notice verse 13 again, and we're just going to notice pronouns here in verse 13 and 14. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. From thy face shall I be hid. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond of the earth. It shall come to pass everyone that findeth me shall slay me. I, 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 me, me, me. Self-focus. Self-focus. Cain was ultimately revealed here just completely absorbed with himself. Everything was about him. Everything was about him. It's all about me. I, 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 me, me, me. And, and why isn't everyone looking at me? And doesn't everyone know how important I am? And, and, and my problems and my needs and my this and my that. And, and it's always focused on self. And can I tell you this? I find this to be 100% accurate. 100% of the time. Self-absorbed people are miserable people. They're miserable. They just see their problems all the time and their wants and their needs and everyone and everything should be about them. And they are miserable because there's never enough, is there? Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes, the eye is never satisfied. Always wants more. There's always something else I should have, I need, I deserve. Years ago... When Seth was our youngest, was two years old, we went to the. Well, we 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 were having some trouble. He, he was drinking a lot of water and and having a lot of issues and got real dark circles under his eyes and was real lethargic and I said something's just not right and my my mom we called my mom and we were talking to her because that's what you do when your kids are sick you call your mom right I mean, so we called mom and we're talking to her she said maybe you should go have his Blood sugar checked. Okay. Is it someone in our family diabetic? No, but maybe you should just have it checked. So we take him to the doctor, and literally the doctor, we said, um, we need to have his blood sugar checked. And the doctor said, well, is someone in your family diabetic? We said, no. She said, well, he's not diabetic then. We said, well, could you just check? And she said, okay. So they checked, and she, she came over a few minutes later. She said, I want you to go down to this address and uh, just go in there, and I'll call ahead and let them know you're... Well, he was, uh, he was about to in, go into a coma from a diabetic coma. 
and um, his blood sugar was over 600. He was just two years old. And so we, we dealt with all that, and God helped us, you know, praise God, we caught it in time, and here we are trying to learn about diabetes, and we know nothing about type 1 diabetes, and, and so it's, it's uh, you know, everything's chaotic and crazy, and, and you ever get to that point where you're just like, why me? You know, I mean, something bad happens, and you go, but why me? I mean, why? God, here I am. And I'm trying to serve you. I'm in Bible college and I'm trying to do my best. And Lord, I tithe. You always got to throw that in there, you know. And I give to missions. And I go out on visitation. And God, you know how we've sacrificed for you. Why me? Come on, don't pretend like you've never had that prayer. Why me? But I remember our first oncology not oncology, uh, endocrinology visit, the diabetes doctor there, and the pediatric diabetes. We, we go in with Seth. He walks in with us, and, and it, it had been a rough couple of weeks. But we walk into this, this hospital where the endocrinology unit was, and as we're walking in, another family is, is wheeling their child in to the endocrinology unit in a bed, or a, a kind of a bed-type chair, because they were quadriplegic as well. And I remember just that quick looking at them and saying, and I've been sitting over here throwing a pity party. Why me? And I said, God, I'm sorry. And by the way, why not you? Why not you? So, well, why would God want bad things to happen in my life? Bad things happen in his life for you. He suffered for you. And you know, the reality is, is that when we suffer, it's the opportunity that we have. It is the singular opportunity that we have to really understand what he went through for us. And suffering is a great opportunity blessing if we receive it properly. Nothing that draws me closer to God could possibly be bad for me. But I can look at suffering and blame God and become self-absorbed or I can receive suffering and say, God, I know that you know what it's like to suffer. And I can rest in his arms and I can receive his comfort and I can receive his his love and his mercy. And listen, there's a wonderful reality of what the Bible says here when the Bible tells us that Jesus said, I will send the comforter. And he is a comforter when we're not absorbed with self. Because God, listen, resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Say, well, why is it so bad that, I, that I'm focused on my problems? Because when you're focused on you, you're living in pride and you're going to be resisted by God. You're not going to receive the grace of God. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now think about what Hebrews chapter number 12 uh, tells us when it says, uh, Take heed lest in any root of bitterness springing up in you trouble you. But he says, Take heed lest you fail of the grace of God. That's what he says. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and you trouble you. How would you fail of the grace of God? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Where does God's grace come from? It comes from our humility. And if we don't exercise humility before God, then we're going to fail of his grace. We're going to become bitter. We're going to be troubled. Our life is going to be destroyed. Self-focus is destructive thought pattern. Hold your place here in Genesis chapter number 4 and turn over to the book of Philippians and notice here what the Lord tells us we are to do in regards to our thinking. In the book of Philippians chapter number 2, we've spoken of it just a moment uh, ago or or just a a few minutes ago, use this phrase. But in in Philippians chapter number 2, he says, 
Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, having being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Notice this mind. This is the mind of Christ. Esteem others better than yourself. Don't look every, on your own things. Look on the things of others. Notice that statement. Others, others, others. Uh, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Notice the mind of Christ, the way we ought to think, is in complete opposition to self-focus. It's about serving others, ministering to others, esteeming others better than yourself, looking at the needs of others. Nowhere in here do we find Christ walking around on this earth saying, Hey, I'm the Son of God. Do what I want. Serve me. Focus on me. Listen to me. Look at me. Right? It wasn't about Him. And yet he was the son of God. And he came and became a servant. And we have one little thing happen. And you say, well, my thing wasn't little. Well, remember this. The only, the only minor surgery is the one that happens to someone else. All right. We get so focused because of what we are going through. And we become self-absorbed. And we don't look at the needs of others. And it's destructive to our thinking. Now, look at this idea here. Because Philippians is, like almost every book here in this, past, this portion, it, it progresses. In chapter number 1, he's talking about how, how we're to put the filter of the gospel on in our mind. In chapter number 2, he's talking about how we're to be faithful to the gospel and obedient to the gospel. In chapter number 3, he talks about how we're to put off the fleshly mind and the thinking of the, of the carnal mind. And then in chapter number 4, we find that we are in this fortified position with God. Our mind is fortified. Our thinking is fortified. It's protected and sheltered. And, and look at verse number 4 here. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And these things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, how do we get to this part of the scriptures? How do we get to this place of rejoicing and peace and thanksgiving and purity and honesty and all of these good things in our life and in our mind? How do we get there? It's by going through the process of the book. By making the gospel the filter of our life. By putting on the mind of Christ and being obedient to the mind of Christ and looking on the needs of others instead of focusing on ourselves, And by putting away the things of the flesh. That's how we get here. It's not just wake up in the morning and go, all right, I'm going to think good thoughts. No. Feeling the good vibes today. Right on. No. It's the mind of Christ that we must have. And the mind of Christ is in diametric opposition to selfishness. So we have to put off selfishness, self-focus. We're almost there. Only two more. I told you I'd get to all of them. Go back to Genesis 4. <clears throat> Verse number 14. Behold, thou hast driven me out. Notice this next statement. From the face of the earth... And from thy face shall I be hid. Now, think about that for a moment. Where is it that Cain could have gone other than the face of the earth? Where is it that he could have gone where God could not see from his face? Literally, there's nowhere. 
But what Cain is doing here is he's exercising what I call universal thinking. That is, his problem was the biggest problem of all problems everywhere in the universe. Nobody had bigger problems than Cain. From the face of the earth, everywhere, my problem is all-consuming. And what we do is we magnify our problems. We magnify them. All right, let me talk about marriage for just a second. So I'm, I'm dealing with emotional pain, right? So, <laughs> you know what they say, that marriage is, um, is a three-ring circus, right? There's the engagement ring and the wedding ring and then the suffering. <laughs> That's a joke, all right. So, the, <laughs> the thing, this happens in marriage. Don't throw rocks at me. Just hold on for a second. This happens in marriage. A man goes to work and he comes home and his wife's hair is on fire. And the worst problem in the history of problems in the entire universe is going on right this moment. It demands his attention this instant. It cannot wait 15 minutes. It must be dealt with right at this moment. It cannot go any further right now. What is it? The trash. Your socks are on the floor. Right? And a man goes, I'll get to it. It's not that big. Come on. It's not that big a deal. It's really? That is what the whole, I mean, the whole world is going to fall apart if that doesn't happen. All right, don't throw rocks at me. But you know I'm right. But why? Why? Because you, sir, this is your fault. Okay, ladies, it's his fault. All right. It's your fault because she's been asking you to help her with that probably for weeks or months, maybe years. She's dropped hints at first because if you ever get a hint, it'll be very romantic. Okay. So at first it's hints and then she gives up on romance and she's just like, I just need it done now. She texts you, she tells you, she writes it on the wall and the big board, you know. She does everything she can to let you know it needs to be done. She needs this done. It's probably preventing her from doing something she needs to do, and it has to be done, and you're the one that needs to do it. You need to do it. And she has figured out that you only do the things that you think are the biggest things that need done. So it's necessary for her to make this thing big so that you see it, because you're blind. Okay, am I right? All right. Now, you would save yourself a lot of time, by the way, if you just do those things at the beginning. A lot of heartache and... Amen. We should probably have an altar call about right now. <laughs> but what she's, what she's doing, by the way, is normal. What she's doing is normal. She's not abnormal. She's normal. If, she, if there's a problem and it's not being dealt with, we have to escalate it and, and make it bigger for it to be dealt with. And here's the thinking problem, though. And I'm going to tell you, men do this too, by the way. I'm not excusing. Man, men do this too. The biggest problem in their life, the thing that needs fixed most imminently, is that, you know, little clip that got broken in the car, you know, that holds the whatever into the dash and so forth, you know. And, and it's the most important thing. And he's got, I mean, if we don't fix this, the whole car is going to fall apart. It's worthless now, you know. And So men do this too. But this 
universalized problem thinking, making the problem bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger becomes a thinking pattern that if we're not careful, escalates our problems to such size that they are unsolvable. And so when people come in for marriage counseling, very often I'll sit down with them and I'll say, what's the problem? And it's like one of them will say, there's too many. Like there's so many problems, it's a mountain of problems. It's not one problem, it's, it's all the problems. It's everything, you know. And it's so insurmountable. And it can't be dealt with. You can't deal with the, with the problem that's so huge that it's immeasurable. It extends beyond the universe. It can't be fixed. And so that thinking problem escalates our problems to unfixable status. And we have to recognize that that problem, as we have elevated it in size, no matter how big it has gotten, we need to get a right view of who God is because every problem is small to Him. And we're fixated on the wrong thing. We're focused on the size of our problem rather than the greatness of our God. And we look over to Psalm 4. Hold your place there in Genesis and look over to Psalm 4. This is a awesome... Did I go to Psalm 4 earlier this week? No? Yes? Stress Psalm, yeah. Yeah, Psalm 4. Okay, hold on. Psalms is still in this Bible, I think. There it is. Psalm 4. Look there at verse number 4. The first step to dealing with stress here. There's six of them. The first one is stand in awe. But here's the thing. Most of the time we're standing in awe of our problem and not of our God. And if you're going to fix this universal thinking problem, you've got to get your view proper. You've got to get it on God. You've got to stand in awe of Him. You've got to recognize His greatness, His, His ability, His strength, His, His might, His magnitude. Instead of elevating and, uh, and enlarging your problem, you need to enlarge your trust and view of Him. Because as you focus on Him, every problem will be diminished. Okay, So this is a view problem, focusing on the problem until it becomes so large that it fills the earth and the universe. All right. Not only is universal thinking create that problem, but it also kind of goes the other way because for some reason when we are in our universal thinking problem, because our problem is so large, it's like in contact with every other problem in the world, so all those problems are our problem. Okay, so gas prices up here are stupid. And I, uh, I was, in Oklahoma they're high, but they're not like this high, right? So you ever, you ever go to the pump, though? Like maybe when the, when the Russia-Ukraine war started and the gas prices jumped all of a sudden, right? And you go to the pump and, they're, and, and you're starting to pump, you're kind of like, why did they do this to me? As if Vladimir Putin called Zelensky and they had this conversation. And they're like, there's some people in the Pacific Northwest that have a little too much money in their account. What can we do to solve that? War. That'll do it. That'll raise the gas price. Let's do it. Like it had anything to do with you. But somehow, right, the egg price went through the roof. Why did they do this to me? Don't they know how tight my budget already is? They weren't doing it to you, okay, specifically. It wasn't about you, right? But universal thinking creates that scenario where every problem that why is this happening to me becomes that, that absorption uh, uh, philosophy as well. All right, here's the last one. Number seven, are you ready? We finally made it. All right, verse number 14. Thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and vagabond of the earth. No, notice this next statement. Shall come to pass that everyone, everyone, generalized thinking, everyone that finds me shall slay me. Everyone on the face of the earth 
has a plan to kill me right now. Right? Everyone. I always have this happen. You never do what I need you to do. Extreme thinking. Always to the extreme. Always, never, everyone, no one. This extreme thinking. This is a lot of conversations that that you'll have, you know, at home too. We can talk about marriage there a little bit, right? You never pick up your socks. Never. Right? You go, yes, I do. Picked them up last week. I know I've picked them up. Had to pick them up to put them on because they didn't get washed because I didn't put them in the hamper. Right? Never, always, this extreme thinking. Okay, now extreme thinking drives us to extreme responses. And we have to be careful about it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this together in this thought. I'm not going to spend a lot of time expounding on this one. What happens here is that Cain has these negative thinking patterns. He's got this, this uh, problem with his expectations. He's fixated on his problems. He is blame shifting and not taking responsibility. He, he's claiming victimhood now. He is self-focused. He's got the biggest problem in the entire universe and everyone's against him. Extreme thinking. And where does this lead him? Away from the presence of God. Right? It drives him away. This issue of departing from God and the state of thought he is in, I think it's one of those things that we can look at and understand a process that leads to depression here in this passage. Because we see the same style of thinking with Saul. And with Saul, the issue of depression is very clearly stated. Okay? But we see all of these same thinking patterns in Saul as well. And he's extreme. Everyone's against me. Everyone's out to protect David. My problem is the biggest problem in the world. I'm a victim here. David, you know, everyone's against me. Saul makes that direct statement. You understand? All of these thought processes are there with Saul as well. And they lead to this state of depression. Depression is, um, is considered to be, by the World Health Organization, is considered to be the number one cause of human suffering in the world. More people are on antidepressants today than any other medication in the world. And the bulk of those people are in first world countries. No, think about that for just a second. Because the people living in third world poverty aren't depressed. It's us in our air-conditioned houses driving our $50,000 cars, having everything we ever wanted, we're depressed. And why? It's not because of our condition. And let me say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of reverse back here. Say, well, it's a medical condition. Okay. I'm going to say that the reality is, is that physical situations can create depression. Sure they can. Thyroid issue can create depression. Cancer can create a scenario where there's depression because the body is not functioning properly. Okay? The uh, postpartum, where a woman's hormones just go wacky after giving birth, it can create depression because there's a hormonal imbalance in the body. Menopause can create depression. Right? Many other illnesses, by the way, even diabetes. Okay, here's the thing though. Those things can be identified, tested, verified, and treated. But you know how they test for depression? Do you feel sad? Lethargic? Have trouble getting up in the morning? 
lack of drive. You're depressed, take these pills. There's no blood issue. There's no, there's no actual medical diagnosis. So are you saying depression isn't real? No, I'm saying it's very real. And if there's a physical reason for it, the physical reason can be identified. But do you realize that statistically, scientific studies have shown this, exercising 30 minutes three times a week has been scientifically shown to be as effective as the most effective antidepressant. That's weird. The problem for most people is not physical. I'm not saying for no one, but for most people it's not physical. It's our thinking. And I've taught this for a long time. I, I learned many, many of these things from Brother Hayes. Uh, uh, the necessity of, of putting on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and, and focus on thank, being thankful and praising God and, and looking for those good things and, and true things, as Philippians 4, 8 says, and, and eliminating expectations. And there's other things here. And, and, and all of this is a reality. But here about a year ago... I, I saw this book, and the title of the book was Depression is Contagious. And I thought, well, that's cool. Sounded neat. I had an airplane ride, so I bought it. And it was by this guy, Michael Yakup, something like that. And he did 40 years of clinical psychological study, 40 years in Australia. And after 40 years of clinical psychological study, he concluded that depression is caused by five primary thought patterns. Expectation thinking, rumination is what he called it, problem fixation, self-focus, globalized thinking, universal thinking, and Extreme thinking, everyone, no one, all things, nothing. I mean, 40 years of clinical psychological study, he came to the conclusion that these are the five thought processes that cause depression. All he would have had to do is read to chapter 4 of Genesis. What I'm trying to say is this, that God gives us solutions for all of these thinking problems that are creating emotional trauma in our life. What I, remember when we talked in Sunday school, we had the tree up here, and we talked about on this side the things that happen to us that cause aloneness, and on this side the way we respond that magnifies aloneness. And here's what we do. We take and we develop wrong and sinful thinking patterns and we have the thing that has happened to us, that problem, that issue, that trouble, whatever it was, and we, we fixate on it, and we ruminate on it, and we, and we dwell on it, and we focus on self and all our, and we make it bigger than everything, everywhere, and everyone's against us, and all of this type of stuff, and we magnify it until it buries us. who's responsible? I mean, who's responsible for how you think? Well, that's just how I was raised. Blame shifting. Yeah. Take responsibility. Repent where there are wrong destructive thinking patterns. Get in the word of God and find the right thoughts to replace the wrong ones and live the gospel. And all of your problems won't go away because we live in a sin-cursed world. But they won't dominate you anymore. you'll have peace 
joy, and victory. In the midst of a world where people are overcome by their problems, you'll be able to be a servant of God that reaches out and helps people instead of one that's under the circumstances.